Hey, Mary, this is Kelly O'Connor. As you obviously remember, you asked me to comment on this Dave Ramsey uh, article here that was posted on his website March 4th of 2011 about the 12% reality. And I just simply copied it and um, put it here. And I know you received this. The black is his comments and the red is or is from that post. And the red is, is my commentary. Now, as you know, Ramsey all the time gets asked this question, can I really get a 12% return on my mutual fund investments even in today's market? And he still continues to say that you can. And, and uh, so this article was cited, where does it come from? And of course he utilizes the S&P 500 as a, as a barometer of what you can get in your mutual funds. And there's some, you know, um, there's some things you can take from that, but uh, the S&P 500 is a stock index and your some mutual funds, a lot of mutual funds aren't hundred percent stock. So, um, you certainly can't expect to get what the S&P actually does. That's why uh, very few mutual funds have ever uh, beaten the S&P because they often have bonds mixed with them. But nonetheless, we'll go ahead and use his numbers. And he was commenting in this article, as you know, about the lost decade, which is referred to as 2000 and 2009. Now in here, he talks about how from 1990, the S&P um, average 19% annually, and then uh, above that 2000, 2009, or, uh, a measly 1%. And he takes the, the two together. So 19 plus 1 is 20 divided by the two decades uh, would yield you a respectable 10% average rate of return. And this is really where there's a lot of flaw in this article. Now, I don't want to specifically come out and, and bash Ramsey. That's not the goal of this, because this myth certainly exists outside of him but he's just a, such a heavy proponent of it. And I want to dig into some of the math here. Keep in mind, one of the things he tells us, he tells us in this bold here that in investing, and this was his bold, I didn't bold it, we can only base our expectations on how the market has behaved in the past. And that is just absolute nonsense. I mean, how silly would it be for GM to stand up and say, hey guys, you need to invest in us because of how good we used to be. No, of course not. They tell you about what's coming up and the expectations of the future and what they're doing. It's 100% about, about, about the future. That comment's just goofy. But let's go ahead and take this um, respectable 10% Average now in this particular article, Dave or whoever wrote this for Dave does not go in does not go into an actual mathematical example, but this is exactly how Dave does this. He does it all over his site, his blogs, his radio show, his books. What he takes is is this average, and then and then calculates that that's what you would earn. So if we took that example, and if we took a let's say one hundred thousand dollars at this ten percent for the twenty years. If you calculate that, that's a return of $672,750. Okay, well, that would be great if it were only true, but it's not. There are three mistakes that Dave makes. First, um, average is not a reflection of actual market um, fluctuation. Um, second is the impacts of, uh, of fees. And third is the impacts of taxation. So let's first look at the actual fluctuations. If we actually invested in the S&P 500 for for uh, for these two decades and rode the roller coaster, we went, we lost, we gained, we lost, we gained. Well, on those years that we gained, if we lost before that, our account is earning on a smaller balance. And if we actually rode the roller coaster with our hundred thousand, we would end up with four hundred and seventy-three thousand. Well, that is significantly different. Look at that as a percentage. That's that's substantial. So uh, that does provide us a rate of return of eight percent. And down here, Dave says or this individual says, hey, percent, that's cool with us, but I would take, um, I have an issue with this part of it. He says, if you would rather project your mutual funds to grow 10 to 8, that's cool with us. Well, you know what? Whatever I project my mutual funds at is pointless. It means absolutely nothing. This word project is totally irrelevant. Actuality is what is important. And if we could, um, if we could base our retirement based off of, of, predictability and guarantees and, and still be winning, that would be far better than just whatever we choose to project. So I wanna look at the effect of taxes and fees, and it is critical. So let's open up the spreadsheet that I, I made for you here. And I wanna illustrate there's two, I'm sorry, three steps that we have to accomplish. What we're gonna be inputting in is our total return, our fees, and our ordinary um, and capital gains tax brackets. Now, here's how easy I do this market share to illustrate what he's talking about, S&P 500, 1990. Um, we go right here to 2009, enter, and there we go, our 20 years. We've got the S&P, this is the actual performance, and it, it follows with his averages. Now, the uh, fees are a little bit different. 
annual fees and mutual funds, there really isn't any study that's going to show you they're under 3%. Um, once you take in uh, transaction fees, 12B1, annual expense, everything, I can show you um, plenty of studies that go into this, and I won't go into detail. I do want to show you one um, actual statement here just recently, April 2011, of a client I was meeting with. Uh, in this account has about 41,000 and we'll look at these three primarily and uh, this is pretty cool to do you just copy the symbol you head up here to finance.yahoo.com you click uh, in here and hit get quotes and then this comes up and we're gonna look at the profile of this one right here this is uh, this particular mutual fund in his statement you're gonna notice a couple things these three expenses are really the same we don't add these up We'll give them credit for about 1.9, 12B1 fees, a marketing fee that you pay, and that great so they can market the fund. But that most of that goes to commissions for whoever's managing your, your portfolio. And this is not added on top of this. This is already included within here. However, um, we do have a couple other fees that need to be calculated because they are not required by the SEC to be reported. Therefore, they definitely choose not to do so. One is money management. Normally this 12B1, the entire thing does not go to the money manager, um, so they very well will be uh, adding on top of that additional amount. That range will range therefore between an additional quarter to a half a percent on average, so we'll go ahead and, and add just a quarter to that. The second thing we want to take a look at is the annual holdings turnover. Now what happens here is this represents how often they are flipping uh, or churning or selling the funds, the portfolio within this account. Now, obviously, if they're selling stocks um, within here, well, there's going to be tax implications to that. And how often do they do that? And if they do it often, then there are the other fees, the second part of the fees, which are transaction fees. And again, I can show you studies that show that the average is typically almost um, half of what the annual expenses are. So According to the averages, this would add like an additional 0.9% just in transactions. Now, if we look at these other two big ones, we're going to notice here that uh, this one is turning over 100%. So this entire 96, this entire portfolio is turning um, every single year without a doubt transaction fees there. And look at these averages. This is the average for this category of mutual fund, 150%. Now the average uh, holding on this one, 50%. So there's there's certainly some some play there. Now, I did create a little spreadsheet here. These are the three mutual funds, 1.9, 1.8, 2.25 is the expense ratio, plus we without a doubt are being conservative here on transaction costs of adding an additional 3 quarters in transaction fees for um for them turning those stocks over and we've got our total uh, divided by 3, that's our average and we're adding an additional quarter point for your and that's on the low end for your money manager. So this actual statement right here, this guy's averaging about 3%. I asked him if, if he was being charged fees, and he said, yeah, and I asked him what it was. Um, he said, uh, I don't know, I probably about a quarter. And I asked him if he was happy with that, and he said, yeah, for what he's getting. Well, he was a little shocked to discover he's sitting at about 3%. So if a fourth or if a quarter percent is worth it, is 1% worth it? Is 2%? At what point is it no longer, quote unquote, worth it? And just how much more are you losing when it gets to the reality of being around 3%? Let's look. So I entered in, if I enter 2.98, of course, uh, the math is correct, but just for the simplicity here, it rounds it up. Okay, now, we got step one, step two done. Step three, the calculating the tax piece. Now, this has to do with, um, really, fundamentally, what these things are invested in. So we go to our holdings and we see predominantly stock here. We see um, predominantly stock on virtually all of these, 77% or 78%, and then uh, this third one, 73. So we are predominantly stock. Now, just you gotta take me at this. Um, certainly, you, this passes with any CFP. We've got to allow for some flexibility with the fund manager to be tax efficient, right? If they're turning it over 100% of the time, it doesn't mean we're at 100% ordinary tax. So realistically, if we're sitting at about a 30% uh, percent for stock-based mutual funds, we're we're being we're being fair. We're being uh, that's a good position. Now, if it was a bond-based fund, so if we would have looked at those percentages and saw a heavy percentage in bonds, well, that's taxable based upon the interest. So that would then be reversed. This would be like 70-30 or 75-25. Okay. If we have a blend, we do 50-50. So this guy's predominantly stock. So 30, 70 is totally fair. So now here we are. 
1990 loss, 3.1%. No tax on that, but we did incur our annual fee, so this is our balance, ending balance, $94,000. Now, 94 comes over here. We had a big year, 30.47% was our gain, 1991. So because we're utilizing 30% of that growth is taxable, that represents 8,594, and we're in a 30% tax bracket is the assumption. Our tax obligation is 25.78. So 94.012 uh, grew 30.47%, uh, but we subtracted out our taxes, subtracted out our fees, giving us an ending balance of 116. Now someone could say you don't pay your taxes out of the account, you just keep it compounding. Well, I can adjust that here, but it's really irrelevant because the taxes have to be paid somewhere. So if I would have to show another account with those taxes coming out, which there's lost opportunity cost, it nets out to be the exact same. So we might as well just reflect it here. So our 116 flows over here year three. We had a gain of 7.6. Uh, of that, we paid tax of 798, but we still paid our annual fee, 120. Now we go all the way down to year 20 and look what our ending balance is, $213,598. They're over $450,000 off. This concept that you get 10% and you end up with 673,000 is horribly flawed because that is not considering the three mistakes that Ramsey made in this article. Market fluctuation, taxes and fees. Look at what it does to you. Now, if we actually look then at what our ending balance truly is, we're solving for rate, $100,000, no contributions, 20 years. Let's go ahead and do 213, uh, 598. 3.87%. Is getting an actual rate of return of 3.87 worth all that risk you took? Is it worth the roller coaster ride and the sleepless nights? Can you easily compete against that in a guaranteed and predictable environment? Yes, you can. So who won? They won and they won. And how much risk did they take? None. They had no risk whatsoever. They earned really no matter what, right? Mary, this is what we do every day. This here, this is real. This is not just some fancy projection because we do have market fluctuation, we do have fees, and we do have tax implications. Now, utilizing this type of system uh, certainly makes money for people um, and it typically is not for us, the consumer, right? So uh, Mary, we look forward to continuing our discussion. Thanks for letting me go through some of this and, and obviously we're in a position to, um, to do better things for you than riding the roller coaster, paying taxes and fees, and you'll, you'll significantly outperform this, all right? We'll talk to you soon.